What? Hey, Matt, can you turn on my... If you're uh, hopefully planning to stay for the class, I'd love to encourage you to come forward just a little bit. Yes, I am happy. No longer a moat. Moat, uh, like a sea of separation. Oh. There's a hand out here, folks. See it. A back row Baptist. <laughs> it's better than a bedside Baptist, I guess. <laughs> I, I know all about that, too. No. <sighs> okay, Mr. Pope is uh, he's putting the he's putting he's putting the, the, the thumb screws on me here. That's right. Yes, it's ten fifty two, and uh, I think our goal is to try and start at ten fifty. Even though I completely forgot to announce my class <laughs> at the end of the last service, at least in the traditional. So I I, I think it probably got announced in here, but. <laughs> Yes, I'm seeing a yes. So, um, well, first of all, welcome to everyone who's here in the room. There is a handout up here that is available. Welcome to everyone who's going to join us. Uh, we don't have many folks yet on Zoom, but uh, there might be some people watching on YouTube. Uh, welcome. This is session two of our class, uh, Crossing the Bridge, which is a class that deals with, um, think it's going to be dealing with over the next several weeks with thinking about and um, reimagining what does mission look like. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the goal of, of our class. And, and let me kind of jump us in here. I feel a little bit weird because usually I have a microphone and I, today I just have this thing. So it's, it's just kind of strange. Uh, so let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine uh, for the reminder of friends, for the opportunity to worship and fellowship and sense your presence. We pray that you are with us now as we engage and think together about what mission might look like and how we might, as a community, go about doing that. In your name, amen. Um, so typically what I try to do uh, at the beginning of most of the classes that I teach is uh, to offer a conversation starter. Uh, today I'm not going to do that actually. Uh, <laughs> we're going to save that for the end, I think. But let me kind of share this and get that up on the screen. Uh, what I want to do, though, is, is, is kind of to jump in, and we really have sort of two uh, tasks today. So last week, and I'll kind of go over a little bit of last week, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, we're going to have about six weeks total of teaching material, and then we're going to have other experiences where people who are already engaged in doing mission and service in our church um, are going to come in and share their experiences with you. Um, the first two weeks, though, of my teaching component is going to have a, a little bit more theoretical, theological element to it, and then we're going to shift. And for about four weeks, you're going to hear from the history of mission. And so we'll be talking about um, different stories uh, in order to sort of call what did mission practice look like for uh, given individuals or given time periods. So today what we, what we need to do is sort of wrap up some of the theological, theoretical stuff, and then I'm going to pivot. We're going to start to pivot in the historical direction today. And remember, all of this really is about, um, uh, it's not just about informing us about, you know, this is what mission looked like, or, you know, it's really about helping us to reimagine what would missional engagement look like uh, in the here and now and for our community. <clears throat> 
Now, last week, let's see, let me kind of go through this. Last week what we did, there were kind of three, three things uh, that I've at least got uh, lined up here. One is just outlining our goals. And I had really two major goals, or I guess I suppose there's, there's really a third that we would include with that. But one was to reconnect us to the history of commitment to mission that's been a part of this, the life of this church. Uh, this church has had a pretty long standing, from what I've been able to determine, uh, engagement with mission in one form or another, whether we're talking about local or international. And one of the reasons why I want to reconnect with that is not just because it's part of the DNA of who we are, but also because it says something which I think it really is uh, essential uh, to us to be reminded of, to be, to recapture, what, to reconnect to, whatever we want to say. And that is that whatever we think mission is, there is a genuinely deep commitment that in some way or another to be Christian and to be church is to be engaged in doing it, right? It's not an add-on. It's not an extra. It's really a part of the expression of the life of this community and has been. And so we want to connect to that. Uh, the second, of course, is maybe the sort of reconstructive or the creative imagining part. Um, and that has to do with the fact that mission and mission language, and we're going to talk about some of this in the history, has a complicated history. It's not always been straightforward. Perhaps it was done out of good uh, intentions, uh, but that, didn't al- that wasn't always the way it worked out. And if you, if you, uh, there's a wonderful book, and I think the title captures it, when helping hurts, right? Uh, is, and you can kind of apply that uh, in a number of ways. And of course, there are some episodes in the history of mission where even that description, I don't think, does justice uh, to what happened. And what I'm talking about there is particularly when places where mission and missionary uh, endeavors got wrapped up with colonization and those kinds of efforts. And so we will talk a little bit about that um, as we move through. But why are we talking about it? We're not just talking about it so we can air our dirty laundry. Uh, We're not just talking about it so that we can be honest, which we do want to be, we we do want to do that. We want to talk about it uh, in part because we want to see the places where things went wrong and understand why, so that we can not allow them to do that again. Not so that we can jettison mission, but so that we can reconceive it. Right? So that's sort of that big idea, that second goal. The third goal then was uh, for us each to understand that we all are commissioned. We all have a kind of calling or um, uh, a sense of being sent. If, it's, if, if being engaged in mission is somehow um, constitutive of being Christian and being church, then that applies not just to the communal level, it applies to all of us. And so we talked a little bit about mission and and co-mission, and that stuff will come back as well. We then looked at a few things to kind of get into this conversation. We talked a little bit about a short history of the terminology mission. One of the big things I tried to mention to you there or to sort of drive home is that the language of mission is actually modern. Uh, the early church never used the terminology that we use for mission to describe what we might describe as missionary kinds of work. Or they had different language. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of, as we move through our time together, this point will come up from time to time, and you, I hope you'll see more of the significance of why I thought it was important to make it. Um, we then turned to, and I utilized uh, a lecture by uh, Stina Busman, Jost, who's a member here in our community. She's also an expert in missional theology. She teaches at Bethel um, and is a good friend of mine. And so she said I could steal all of her ideas for the lecture, which is what I did, basically. And we utilized that missional theology material Uh, in part because it was the missional theology movement that came to recognize some of the problems uh, that has attended Christian mission engagement. And missional theology basically was a movement, as I mentioned before, that arose in the wake of the Second World War, right? With the collapse of European culture and civilization and effectively the de-Christianization of those societies, well, what is it going to mean to be church now? Um, how do we think about mission, et cetera? Uh, 
those were all kinds of questions on the docket, and so they went to work, and that has evolved over time into a conversation that's typically called the missional theology conversation. I then uh, turned at the end of that discussion, and we gave a brief reading of Acts chapter 10, and one of the main reasons I wanted to look at Acts chapter 10 was to emphasize that mission is as much about the conversion of us as it is about anything else or the transformation of us as it is about anything else and that sometimes that transformation pushes the bounds of what we might think is acceptable um, and maybe even overturns our most some of our most cherished ideas and so Acts chapter 10 is the story of Peter and Cornelius and if you remember Cornelius is a Gentile um, but he's a God-fearing Gentile, which means that he, does, he attends probably synagogue, but he doesn't necessarily, he maybe even keeps kosher, but he's never been circumcised. So he's praying to God, asking for a vision, and he, God basically says, go find this guy Peter. Um, Peter also simultaneously is having a vision of, uh, in which like a, a, you know, a sheet with all kinds of animals, clean and unclean, are lowered down, and the Lord saying, eat. <clears throat> and what's the implication? The implication is that there's nothing that's unclean. And what happens? Cornelius, a Gentile, invites Peter to his house. Well, this is a big deal for a Jew. That's what Peter is. And he goes. He decides to enter into the house of a Gentile, which presumably would make you unclean. Um, so he crosses a boundary that he would not normally cross. And, uh, and then he starts to speak. And before he can even get you know, two words out of his mouth, you have a second Pentecost. Right, the spirit falls, and it falls on Cornelius, his whole household. And Peter basically is like, the Gentiles are receiving the promise too, which is, all, I only thought that it was meant for us. And, you know, so literally his whole conception of church and of the community is being upended in this missional encounter. And what's the point we're trying to make, we're trying to say is that when we go out, as we're being called out into the world, part of what's going to happen is we're going to encounter folks that are going to challenge what does it mean for us to be church, and hopefully it's going to be a two-way street, right? The missional encounter is not just about us going out, bringing something, yada, yada, yada. It's also about what we receive in that process. So being missional must include listening, right? That's a huge component that I wanted to try to drive home, and we did that with Acts chapter 10 and some of the insights there. Uh, that Stina actually had, had also kind of developed. Then I said there were basically two big takeaways. Um, the two big takeaways in my mind <clears throat> for, for last week is that mission is most properly not the work of the church, it's really the work of God. That God is really the great missionary, that God is the one who is out working in the world. You know, the Cornelius scene is a great example, right? That, that God is speaking to someone who's not, wouldn't be considered, right, in the, in the fold or whatever. Um, so God is the one doing the work. So what does that mean? It means that what our call is, is to discern where God is at work and to join in, right? So that sense of being attentive, listening, discerning, et cetera, that's going to have to be uh, a key component. And then the second big takeaway is that we are all, called in different ways and with a sense of freedom as well. And I really do like to emphasize this kind of improvisational sensibility that we talked about from sort of the jazz world, uh, that we're all called into that transforming work that God is already doing. All right, so those were sort of the big things that we talked about from last week. So the first thing I really want to do then is... is this is kind of concluding, in a sense, what we started with last week, which was some of the big theological, you know, theoretical conversations before we pivot and turn into more sort of historical data-centered um, kind of uh, exploration. And I would like to really offer to you a kind of working theology of mission. Uh, a theology of mission is, uh, it, it might be a way of just describing, this is how we, are, we, we conceive what mission looks like. What is it that we're trying to do? What is it that we think that God is trying to do in and through us, with us, etc.? So this is a working theology of mission. Essentially, it's a proposal. And uh, it's meant to offer then a kind of umbrella understanding of what missional engagement for us could look like. 
Um, I want to underline here, it's very definitely informed by the core values that our church has already identified. So, uh, yes, I am offering this to you, but it is informed already by what you have said about yourself that you value, that you think our community values. So can we deploy this in a way, excuse me, that is particularly attuned to moving out into the world and engaging the world? And what I'm going to give to you then is kind of an initial big umbrella and then um, some additional components to add to that uh, as we move through. And then I'll kind of stop for a second and see what kind of comments or questions there might be. Uh, do we have any friends on Zoom? We have zero. Okay. All right. Well, I don't think it mattered if I started or not. Um, or I guess it mattered to all of you, uh, all of our beautiful people in the room. Um, so as I was thinking about this, and I was kind of reflecting on our core values, and I was reflecting on themes that we have um, preached on and utilized and have come up in conversations, to me the big sort of umbrella of what does it mean to do missional engagement, I, I just decided it, it sounds something like this, becoming a good neighbor. That, that what we're trying to do when we are engaging in this missional way is to become a good neighbor, all right? And so I want to kind of unpack these three, uh, kind of three terms. The first one is the becoming term. And, and basically, you could, we could have said being a good neighbor, be a good neighbor. I, uh, of course, as I was doing it, I was like, I got to be careful because I don't want to, you know, step on state, state farms toes <laughs> or Applebee's toes, you know, so I need to be, I have to be aware. So becoming then is one that I, but I did choose it actually for the reason that this idea that it's a journey and a process, um, that it's not a one-time, necessarily a one-time intervention, that in a sense, missional engagement, and if we're going to argue that it really is baked into our community, we need to understand it that it takes time and that it is a journey and that part of what we're being called to is sort of a journey of partnerships with others that live beyond um, the, certainly the walls of our church um, uh, and maybe even the walls of our lives. So becoming. And then the second term that I thought was important, of course, is the neighbor term, right? So becoming a neighbor, and I'll come back to the good in just a minute. I like neighbor, first of all, I like neighbor because it just sounds folksy. It just sounds down to earth. You sort of know what it means, you know, so you have a working idea to a certain extent. Uh, but I, I really liked it because it implies a kind of proximity. And, and I wanted to do this for two reasons. One is oftentimes when we have talked about mission in the, in the life of the church, we have tended to think it's about sending people over there, right? I think last week, uh, when I asked you to kind of what, it, you know, when you hear the word mission, what comes to mind? Um, I think Janet Ruth, right, shared, um, well, it means sending someone to a scary place where they have snakes, <laughs> right? And we talked, and I, and I said, yeah, that's a valid, because that would be how we have often talked about this, is that it's something that's done over there, somewhere else. But neighbor, I think, gives a sense that, no, number one, it, it implies proximity, um, and so living our life in the here locally is also missional. And I don't just mean this in terms of like we're going to work with, you know, people in North Minneapolis or Northeast or South or whatever. I simply mean that sense of proximity and nearness, that that is important. And it's, it's important not just as a description of, you know, are we here or are we somewhere else? But I think the second part is this idea that we want to come near to other people that this is not a work that we need to do, that we're supposed to be doing at a distance. Um, sometimes you can read in the history of mission where it feels like it's done at arm's length, right? Someone goes into an area or a region um, and they sort of work with the quote-unquote natives and maybe there's a sense of an, at an arm's length. We want, I want to break that down 
um, as, if we're having that kind of conception all, uh, at all as we think about what does it mean to do missional engagement. There's a kind of nearness coming together. Um, neighbor also can indicate a relationship of care, right? Um, if you are a good neighbor, you're trying to do what you can to care also for those who are around you. I remember in my house, I was having some issues with our sump pump, and um, the you know the house would you know I don't know how to expel whatever the the water, and it would it the, there's a slight hill, but it would roll down into my neighbor's yard. So I said, and I it was it was expensive, but I was like I've got to be a better neighbor, and so we bought up and built a drain tile, right? That's just that sense of care, wanting to care for the people that are around you, whether they see it or not, it, it, it almost doesn't matter. And I think the, the last thing to me that I thought was particularly important in this was the significance of the parable of the Good Samaritan. And, uh, you know, typically, right, that is a story about what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, first of all, the question, who is my neighbor, is the wrong question. The real question is, am I being a neighbor? But the second thing that is important, I think, that makes sense for us to bring it into our context is that a Samaritan would have been, and the encounter between a Jew and a Samaritan would have been an interreligious and intercultural encounter. It would have been a missional kind of encounter, right? And so there's some lessons there, I think, for us to, to, to pull out and to sit with. All right, so becoming uh, a, a neighbor. It's not just, though, and this is where the good part comes in, it's not just any proximity. Um, that, that will not do. It is a proximity described as good. And I kind of wish I'd had a chance as I was pulling this together to spend some time talking to, to Steph Spencer who does our scripture circles, because she has a lot to say about the Hebrew word tov, which is the word good. And uh, so I you know, did my best to sort of poor man Steph Spencer version, but tov is typically, uh, you know, it shows up initially in Genesis chapter one, where God sees what God has done and describes it as good. Well, it's typically connected to notions of wholeness, of sh God's shalom, of Sabbath, and it has both material and spiritual dimensions. That's the kind of neighbor we're trying to be. That's what I believe. Um, we're, in other words, when we're doing missional engagement, we're not just going out and um, uh, you know, screaming the name Jesus from the housetops or something. We're actually trying to care for people's bodies. We're actually trying to care for the social and systemic realities in which they live, um, and we're doing so in ways that hopefully express to them care, and that in also uh, are partnering ways, right, that don't leave them out, that make them fully engaged uh, uh, communities or, what, or whatever. So this then, good also then implies attending to the real longings and needs. You don't just go into a space with a sort of cookie cutter approach, right? We've determined what good is, um, and so what we think is good for you is what we're going to do for you. No, no. You go in and again, you listen, you discern. You have to spend time getting to know what are the actual challenges that a community faces um, and what would it mean, what would be good for them? What would be good to them? What would they value and feel as good? So that listening, learning, and discerning um, is a huge component, I think, of any kind of good uh, missional uh, endeavor. So. Lastly, then, to seek the good of our neighbor, then, might be another way of describing trying to learn to love our neighbor, right? So I think this, to me, is a kind of a very usable, overarching sensibility. From time to time, I'm probably going to bring it up and bring it back into our discussion as we move through uh, some of the history. So let me just stop for a second, see what kind of comments or thoughts folks may have. I have here... Will you pass this around, Paige? You can even talk if you want. <laughs> I would love to hear your responses to this. 
Well, I just thought of two phrases. One was Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? And then Young Life has the motto or whatever you want to call it, winning the right to be heard. Hmm. Just thought That's of great. those two things. Yeah. Mr. Rogers was very much, I think, in my subconscious during this. So. Others? For me, the thing that you just said that is, will be a takeaway that I feel like I can really uh, grasp onto is that listen, learn, discern. I have a young niece who is involved in missional work that I fear, um, knowing my sister, and uh, doesn't approach mission work in that way. So I've been praying hard about that, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been continuing to think about what we talked about last week and kind of the, I see it as um, expanding our perspective on mission and not kind of getting caught, because we talked about narratives last time that we get caught in. And um, your reinforcement of God is at mission in the world. And then kind of transcending when you talk about listening, not just listening to the people we're considering ministering to, but also listening to God, because I know I see so many opportunities to serve and I get overwhelmed. And so if I take time to listen to God, to where am I truly being called to truly be effectively used by God in the mission that God's already in the process of doing, I think that helps me connect better yeah. to where I'm needed. That's great. Yeah. So both, that's a really nice kind of um, turning of it because typically the way I've talked about, right, is listening, discerning, especially with those whom we're, we're trying to engage, understand their context. But as I've said other, in other ways, like we have to discern where is God at work and how are we being called? So I think that's great. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Other comments or thoughts or pushback or objections? Rick? Okay. Sustained? Okay. All right, let me then, let me then kind of uh, peel it out just a tad more and add um, just like kind of another layer to this before we pivot in sort of that historical direction that I said we were going to turn to uh, this week. And, um, and that is under, what, what I would also like to say as we think about what does it mean to become a good neighbor is that we think about something along the lines of hospitality, solidarity, and sojourning. That these are sort of the most basic postures, practices, et cetera, that should shape how we're imagining and maybe hopefully also how we're engaging in doing this. Um, I describe here, I put on your outline, postures, dispositions, practices, Obviously, I can't go through the entirety of that, all three of those terms, but it gives you a sense of you, you take up a certain posture in the world, you have a certain kind of disposition about the kind of work you're going to do, and then there are certain practices that flow out of that that are going to inform and shape that. And uh, the three that I want to suggest, as I have already mentioned then, are hospitality, solidarity, and sojourning. I think, and I think here, I hope that you especially hear in some of this, the deep resonance with our core values. Um, to me, one of the best ways of thinking about what mission might be, what missional engagement might be, is to think about it as extending and participating in God's hospitality, right? That that's, in a sense, uh, what we are genuinely being called into. Um, the word that oftentimes is used in scripture, in fact, I think it's almost, the, it's the primary word for hospitality, uh, is this word phylloxenia. Um, and uh, xenia is, uh, you know, so also sort of the Greek verb, you know, or the root of xenophobia, right? So when you're afraid of the stranger, afraid of the other, this is the opposite. The love of the other, the love of the outsider, the love of the stranger. Um, and that this, it seems to me, is what God is about in Scripture on its most basic level. Um, if we, and I, I, I think I offered to you actually a pretty fulsome picture of this last year around this time when we were doing a, a sort of a class on the Lord's Supper. Uh, 
And uh, part of the argument that I tried to make there was that if you look at Genesis chapter 1, and essentially what God is trying to do in, in creation, in creating, is to make space and time for others. And I mean that not just in the sort of literal he's making space and time kind of sense, but that God is like, you know, how you have to make space for your friends and you have to make time for your friends, that kind of idea. That's what I mean by that sense of hospitality, that, so that there's something there that's quite remarkable. Um, and Scripture picks this up, this idea of hospitality gets picked up multiple times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I talk about up here extending you know, the table fellowship of Jesus. One of the main ways that Jesus expresses his ministry is through sharing meals with people. And if you read through the gospel stories, you see that all kinds of things are happening in those meals. Right? There's instruction, there's nurture and nourishment, there's forgiveness, there's restoration, there's rebuke. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen in the context of that fellowship. Um, one of the most striking uh, texts, in a, a text that I preached actually on here a long time ago, um, or I, it feels like a long time ago, it's probably only two years, I guess, uh, boy, I've aged, oh, that's all I can say, is Isaiah 25, where Isaiah 25, you know, talks about at the end of all things on this great mountain, once God has removed the shroud that hovers over all people, I will host a banquet. That that's what salvation is, in a sense, is this sense of banquet, hospitality, welcoming in, um, right, bringing in. The thing that I think sometimes gets lost and even though this is written here in a subsidiary, is a subsidiary point, is that we often, when we think about hospitality, we think that it has only the primal agency of the host, that it's the host that sets the table, it's the host that invites people in, and certainly there is, you know, a case can be made for that, but I think what we actually find, and, in, and if you do sort of a real breakdown of the anatomy of what hospitality is like, there's actually a lot of negotiation of who's really the host, who's really the guest. Like a good host will let a guest become a host, right? They'll bring food or they'll, you know, and, and if you read scripture in certain key stories, there are places where the tables get turned. The person who's supposed to be hosting winds up being the guest and the guest winds up being the host, etc. cetera. So my, what's my point in all this? My point is that it's a two-way street, right? And that's what I've been trying to say all along, that missional engagement, we have got to conceptualize this as a two-way street in which we are going to be as much changed as anyone else. And that, in fact, if we really want to be changed, and I mean change for the good, growth kind of change or whatever, then we actually need to engage in this because this is one of the principal ways that God is using or wants to use to change us. So hospitality... The second is uh, a term, the term so solidarity. Uh, there's no precise, exact biblical uh, term for this, uh, but some of the ones that sort of intersect with it, uh, koinonia, stereo, and covenant have come up. And, and uh, th this was at least what kind of bore out in my relationship. And what, what it means to have solidarity with those whom we meet means to enter into their situation, right? As I say here, to enter into a mutually strengthening relationship, um, to, to take up, in a certain sense, their posture in the world precisely to show that we care and that we understand and that we want to be with them in that midst. So to take on the concerns and cares of others um, to bear burdens, and so that instruction about bearing burdens that we heard about last week in our different services is not just an instruction that's apropos for in here, for in the life of a community. It's also something that we're called to replicate as we engage, as we enter into the world. And then the last one, it really does, it connects then to uh, that becoming that we talked about earlier, and that is the notion of sojourning. That this, is a, that this is something that's a journey. It takes time, and we're called to enter into it in that kind of sensibility, right? So sojourning here, and I just simply mean by this, journeying together. Um, 
the World Council of Churches in the 1980s and 1990s was really talking about sojourning, particularly with the language of learning how to cultivate real partnerships. Um, that you become, you become a partner as much as you are a missional agent with someone. And partnership is hard because partnership means that the other has as much of a voice as you, right? So again, that sense of two-wayness is important. But sojourning, right, going down this path together, um, developing friendships, uh, and allowing that sense, that posture of friendship that, that, uh, that, that we want to develop to, to be uh, informing the way that we're going to live um, our life in the world. And so here I bring then back in this idea, right, that really God is the missionary, right? It, ultimately, God is the one who works on the heart. Um, God is the one who uh, lets, lets whatever form of Jesus needs to come forth to come forth in the life of other people. Our task is really to learn to love people. That's what missional engagement really means. And that's what I said before, becoming a good neighbor, right? Our task is to come alongside, to learn and to love. And of course, what we have to discern is where are we being called to do that, right? Um, because uh, I wish we could let a thousand flowers bloom but we can't necessarily do that. We have limited resources, we have very specific contexts, and we have very particular opportunities, and we wanna make sure that we are understanding what those look like. All right, so let me stop there. That's kind of the, the pitch, uh, the theological pitch, um, and I wanna just see if there are other comments or questions or things that I can clarify. Suzanne? Well, I guess that I'd love to hear about this because um, if I listen, he tells me. <laughs> he says, so-and-so, this is a hard time for her. This is hard. You can do something. I think of something. And so I say, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> and so if I listen to him, he sends me. And inevitably, it's something that is very touching or helping someone else. So... I think to try to live that way, to listen to each other and to reach out and to help and to comfort in any way that we can. And, you know, sometimes people don't, ex don't expect that you would come, but if you come, it means a great deal of comfort and um, love to them. So I think listen and then do. And I tell myself that, oh boy, I hear it. Okay, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> so I do. Yeah, well, and I was going to, as you were talking to, I was reminded, I mean, so, in some contexts, some cultures, just presence matters a lot. It matters more than doing. But in some cultures, doing matters a lot, right? And so it's precisely that task of discerning, right? What is our call? What, what, would, be, what would be best? What would express true care to this community, this partner, et cetera. Um, and, and that, again, then just, you know, requires that sense of listening. Yeah. Dave? This suggests being uh, really good listeners uh, and active listeners so you can find those points of connection with the other person rather than something to offer them, but, to, you know, be able to receive what they have to offer to you as well. And I think the State Farm thing may not be so far removed because both in terms of, of the agent who, who tries to find the point of need to make that connection, so the industry tries to make that connection. So looking for those ways that, that uh, the other person or the other uh, agency actually provides part, an expression of the gospel to them. I, Dave, I love it. I think I thought of like five jokes as you were saying it about State Farm. <laughs> like, could we get State Farm to sponsor our mission work? Could Jake come <laughs> and hang out? You know, there were all kinds of... But I, I think, yeah, that sense of connection and attunement. And oftentimes the way, again, in the history, that has not always been the case, or at least it's not always been obvious that that is what the case is. Um, uh, so there will be some examples where clearly that is, has been somewhat something of the case. Michelle. 
Yeah, when I think of um, like the postures and uh, or when we think of even mission as how we've described it in the past, it's something that we kind of plan to do. And I think a lot of times what you're laying out there, the hospitality, the solidarity and the sojourning um, oftentimes means we're interrupted from what we were planning to do, whether, um, you know, from a personal relationship or from something out, um, outside that, um, like Suzanne said, like when you're listening, sometimes it's not convenient. And so um, finding those ways to, um, mm. to have that posture of I'm willing to be interrupted. I love that. And even those commitments, like people who um, I know in this room serve, you know, every week or serve and when you just don't really want to. And um, not that you can't have some healthy boundaries and say no sometimes, but that you, um, your, your solidarity, your sojourning with people and the way that you live out hospitality allows you to maybe um, be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Can you preach that next week? Um, you know, Rick and I run an Airbnb out of our house, and it's uh, it really speaks to a lot of what you're saying about hospitality and even solidarity. And I think a lot of people think, well, that's that's a business, and you know, we charge people, and but it's in our own home. They don't have a private entrance. They use mm -hmm. our kitchen. They use our laundry. They so we are interacting with folks all the time, and it's a big it's a big vulnerability on both sides because people are coming into your space, into your home. And, but they're also being vulnerable because they're in, you know, unknown territory. And we've had a lot of experiences with folks who, um, we've even had a few people who've never been to the United States before. We've had guests who don't speak English, who are moving here, who have pets or kids. And um, it's been the, the hospitality going both ways. We experience that a lot with folks wanting to make us a meal um, or just being very grateful for what we've done. And even though it's um, something that it's predictable. We have a calendar. You know, we, we know when people are coming. There is that level of, can I jump off this Zoom call to help someone learn how to turn on a stove because they've never been to the United States before? So it's a really interesting, like, mission of inconvenience, of um, guidance, of just kind of being someone's constant presence when they're in the middle of a transition, especially we've had folks who've been getting divorced or making major moves in their lives. So it's kind of it's kind of a mission in a way that we just kind of try to live out in our daily lives, even though um, it's, it wouldn't strike people that way maybe, but. Yeah, but I, I love that, that and, and particularly that sense of vulnerability and uh, the, the give and take mm -hmm. that happens. I mean, that's the way that I think we need to be thinking about what missional engagement is. And I don't mean in the sense that like, oh, we do it, so we instrumentalize them so they'll change us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to become vulnerable in those spaces, right? And allow that them to speak into our lives and allow them to change us, et cetera, because God is actually at work in that back and forth. Um, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And, and to hear, like, you have folks coming in from, you know, outside of the United States, you probably are showing them some things, but they're probably showing you some things, right? And, it, and there's a kind of mutual enriching that happens. I think that's great. Other, any other comments? Oh, Rick. Here comes that objection. Yeah, no. Um, and, and, you know, obviously dovetailing and agreeing with everything that Paige said. There she is. Um, but I come from the world of hospitality and from restaurants, and, and one of the founding tenets of good hospitality, and we talk about this a lot, is anticipating people's needs. And that can be a really powerful tool and, like, a really, it's a lot to think about. And like if you think about it in the sense of a restaurant, like you might think of the, the server who's always refilling your water glass. Well, that's probably overbearing. But if you have someone who's really uncomfortable with a menu, for example, being able to like notice that body language of, of someone just looking at like eyes glazed over and just like, I have no idea what I'm even staring at right now. And coming down and coming to their level and saying like, hey, can we explain some things on the menu to you? I know there's a little bit of weird things going on here, but like, let's talk it out. So anticipating needs and, and being there for people is, is part of what Paige was saying too with, with our Airbnb. I, yeah, I just, I, I really loved, I mean, this posture of learning I mean, if you think about that as missional engagement, 
And that's one of the reasons why we're doing, we, we've been doing these faith and forums, faith in humanities, faith in justice, is because we need to learn, we need to hear, we need to discern uh, before we just throw ourselves into things. Uh, sometimes our helping, even though we intend it for good, really does hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, a kind of an example of uh, that I learned on a mission trip. Um, we were in Haiti and we were helping people build homes. And when we got down there, um, we didn't really interact with them first and kind of figure out what the plan was. And we kind of hopped in, but we also kind of took over. And um, it was really interesting because we were measuring and cutting and, you know, and then they had this real simple process where they would put a board up and when it came to the end of the house, they'd cut it off. It was super efficient and it worked just well for the type of house they were building. But we kind of came in with our preconceived notions of what, you what know, what fabrication how to build a house should look like, yeah. And what that should look like. And there was all kinds of confusion and animosity and a lot of that was just because we assumed that they wanted us to build a house how we wanted to build it rather than learn we learned a lot that day we learned mm -hmm. a lot of simple ways to build a house that doesn't require lots of fancy equipment so and that and it, it honestly these are these are exactly the kinds of insights about learning right and 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 with going in not like as savior and I hope that once we've displaced that the church is the one who does mission, it's, it's really God, once we've kind of, help, that that should help some of that. But we need to hear these kinds of where, you know, we're, we're learning to become attentive. And, and that really, that's going to mean friendship. It really is. It's going to mean, um, it really is going to mean partnering together in some way or another. To, to really get to know what, what really speaks to someone is going to require that and require time. Dave, last comment. The word that comes to my mind is mutuality and we I think there's a tendency to use missions as a top-down I'll, I'll use my strength to your weakness right rather than being uh, learning from each other and to mutuality that's right absolutely that's beautiful that's a great uh, I'm gonna I want to shift us now I, I hope that this gives you some language and conception to as we think about mission um, now what we're going to kind of start to do and over the next couple of three, four weeks is we're going to kind of engage in some of the vignettes from the history of um, mission. And I want to uh, kind of set up a little bit of this today um, with just this, this question, right? How did the Jesus way actually spread? And I'm talking here, you know, just how does, how does, the, how does the gospel get transmitted um, uh, in the early church, and then of course that's going to lead us into other kind of vignettes and moments. And I'm going to make a couple of comments um, to give you a sense uh, that it it didn't exactly spread maybe the way that we think about that we think that it spread. Uh, there's some of it, but there's actually something much more mundane that comes a little bit closer, I think, to something like becoming a good neighbor than the ways that we sometimes talk about and think about. So the first is just to remind us, as I mentioned before, that language of mission, it doesn't really exist in the early church. There is no office of a missionary um, that does not exist until the 16th century. Uh, so when you conceptualize and you think about mission, you think about the church, you know, kind of call these missionaries together and empower them and authorize them and sent them out, that is not exactly what we're talking about when we really look historically. The closest thing that we do have to this is apostle, the language of apostleship and an apostle, this does carry some of the connotations that we often typically will associate with mission or missionary as someone who's sent forth because apostle literally means someone who's sent, right? So Paul talks about himself as an apostle, uh, Peter as an apostle, we get other kinds of language in scripture. So there clearly is an element of this. The other closest uh, term that we have in the early history of the church is the, is the description of someone as an evangelist. Um, and this, this we do find places where this is described in scripture. But as I mentioned here, by the end of about you know, the second century, so the 100s, uh, 
pretty much the office of evangelist as someone who's sent out and preaches the gospel, you know, to people who don't really know what the gospel is, it falls completely out of use. Um, and it's not used certainly in the Latin or Greek church for about five or 600 years. All right. At the same time though, the faith is still spreading. So how is that happening if you don't have an official office of missionary and you don't have an official office of some of the co closest correlates that we might describe like evangelist and or even apostle, right? That also language doesn't come to be used to describe specific people. Um, there are a couple of things also that we want to um, uh, uh, roll into this in terms of that, nevertheless, the faith still spreads. One is the fact that some of the most important early centers of Christianity are founded by people we have no idea. We don't know who founded these churches. I think one of the best examples of this is the church in Rome. Uh, we don't know who founded the church in Rome. We don't know how it got there. We don't know how the gospel got there, um, how it came into being. The other place, and uh, I was kind of reminded as, of this as I was doing sort of research on this, but the other place where kind of um, Christian identity uh, and the church it, um, sort of penetrated the culture most deeply early on, at least, was in North Africa. And the center of that would have been the city of Carthage. We don't know how it got there. It's just, there's no, there's no historical records. We just don't know. And you would think those would be very important places. So if there was someone super important connected to those places, then some kind of, uh, you know, record, at least a legend would have been preserved. And we just don't have that. So that I think is, is, uh, is important to note. We do of course want to acknowledge that there is some deliberate sending forth. There are places where we can see this. You can see it in scripture, obviously. You see it in the book of Acts. These folks are typically called evangelists or apostles. There is also beyond the writings of the New Testament, other early church figures. The two most prominent ones that sort of show up in mission studies are Origen of Alexandria, who was pretty much writing in the late second into the early third century, and then Eusebius, who is late third century into the early fourth. So about a hundred years or so uh, time span. Um, Origen emphasizes that whoever was sent out was clearly anonymous. We don't know who they were, um, but he does think that people were sent out. And remember, he's writing, he's writing these statements, by the way, in about 240 or so. You, um, Eusebius does the same thing. He kind of talks about the anonymity, and he, offers, he, he, he actually offers a couple of examples of specific individuals. But, and I think this is the most important, both Origen and Eusebius describe these actions as something that happened in the past and it's not currently going on. So by the time we're getting up into the late second and into the third century, they're not actually even doing anything that looks like mission that we talk about. And yet, the faith is still spreading. That's this is sort of question I want, like, how, so how? Why is that the case? What's going on here? Well, the best, I think, explanation that we have is that it's mostly spreading through migration and the sharing of everyday life. That is really how um, people come to hear about Jesus, come to experience who Jesus is, come to be attracted to the way of Jesus or the way of the community that marks itself by that name is by the sharing of everyday life. And the way that that encounter often happens is through migration, basically. Um, migration itself could be voluntary. Yes, uh, there are clear examples of um, uh, you know, merchants in particular going to, into certain areas uh, because that's what business requires. But actually quite a lot of migration that probably results in the growth of the early Christian church has to do with um, involuntary or forced migration. Um, and this could come through a variety uh, of different ways. The, the, one of the best early examples actually that we see though is in Acts chapter 8 and then later in chapter 11. What happens in Acts chapter 8? Well basically um, Stephen, 
who is one of the great deacons. He, you know, he gives a speech, and it really pisses off. It makes him so angry that uh, they stone him to death. Uh, Paul is kind of hanging out there, and what the text tells us in verse 1 is that the believers are scattered, right? So they literally have to flee. So it's involuntary in this, in this case, their migration. Well, you don't hear anything else about that, and then you come back in, in uh, chapter 11, verse 19, and it's almost like a throwaway verse, and it basically says the people who were scattered, they went to Antioch, and what did they do? They found a community in Antioch. So an involuntary um, moment of migration is what results then in the gospel sort of spreading out in a different kind of way. Um, Think about the ancient world as a world of profound instability. Uh, People are not, they're they're, uh, susceptible to famine, uh, disease, natural disaster, and of course, uh, warfare and violence. And... Uh, at least according to, you know, depending on the data you look at, you look at 80, 90% of the population is indentured or enslaved in one form or another. They're not really their own masters, and therefore you can understand how you could have involuntary migration pretty, pretty easily. And if you, of course, layer in the idea that most of, many, most, much of early Christianity was made up of folks from the lower classes, you see that. A good example from about the third century of this was a war breaks out between the Romans and the Persians, and the Persians invade the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and they take the town of Edessa, which at that time had become a really vibrant uh, Christian center just on the edges of the desert in Syria, and they take much of the population as prisoners and relocate them into the Persian Empire. Well, much of that population was Christian. So all of a sudden you have a significant Christian presence in Persia, which eventually becomes the basis later on of the Persian church. So migration is a huge factor, which here I'm just simply saying, which means it was not a sort of highly organized, directed by the tops up in the center, go out to the periphery kind of a thing. It's something that just sort of happens, right? In terms of the vagaries of history or God's will or whatever you want to say. Well, as they go forth, then, what do they do? They wind up, and this is where I think the second uh, element is very important, they wind up just sharing everyday life with people. Um, And just to give you a couple of uh, things to kind of chew on in this regard, there's a really interesting letter. It's an early Christian letter from the late second century um, called the Epistle uh, to Diogenetus. And in it, he talks about... Um, uh, the Christian, you know, like, what, what is, how do Christians live with their neighbors, basically? Can I, is there any possibility for me to get a couple of, maybe one, at least one volunteer who'd be willing to read a little passage or two? Would you, John, can I, can I enlist you to read yeah. something? All right. Is that turned on? Hello? All right, perfect. Okay, so here's the first passage. The difference between Christians and the rest of humankind is not a matter of nationality or language or customs. For Christians do not live apart in separate cities of their own, speak any special dialect, nor practice an eccentric way of life. They pass their lives in whatever township, Greek or foreign, each person's lot has determined, and conform to ordinary local usage in their clothing, diet, and other habits. All right, what's the point? The point here is that they live alongside of their neighbors. They do not separate themselves. They're part of the common life, right? They're they're together uh, with others, all right? Now, ready for number two? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the organization of their community does exhibit some features that are remarkable and even surprising. For instance, though they are residents at home in their own countries, their behavior is more like that of transients. They take their full parts as citizens, but they also submit to anything and everything as if they were aliens. All right. Now, here is kind of the pivot. They live alongside their neighbors. They're a part of the fate 
of that place, right? They, they speak the language, they eat the food, they understand the customs, and yet they are different, right? And that difference has to do with that they know and understand that they have certain loyalties to there, but also a greater loyalty, right? A loyalty that exceeds that. And then this then translates into a basically kind of Diogenes, and I'm just giving you a little excerpt here. Could you read this very last piece? They show love to all people, and all people persecute them. They are poor, yet making many rich, lacking all things, yet having all things in abundance. So this, to me, I, I kind of brought this in because it was just the, you know, the, 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 the uh, shortest clip. In other words, the way that they, it's the way that they live alongside their neighbors that makes them unique. They live with their neighbors, they live alongside them, they're no different from them, and yet there is something different about them. And what that is, is that they love. They love one another and they love their neighbors, right? No matter what they get back from them, essentially. So it, my point here uh, is simply that in a world uh, of you know, poverty, disease, etc., the Christian practices of caring for the orphan, the widow, of burying bodies, of taking in unwanted children, it's all those kinds of, those would become the basis of the attraction that would lead others then to want to embrace um, uh, the Christian way. All right, I think I'm gonna stop there. You wanna, you have a comment? Okay, um, to be uh, respectful and to honor you in having come uh, early, so as we started at uh, 1050, it's now 1152. I think I started right at 1052. I think I'll kind of land the plane here. We'll do the, I'll save the rest of the material for the very beginning of our next session together. Next week, what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about the Irish tradition. I want to start with um, the idea of pilgrimage, which I think connects to what we've talked about as sojourning. Uh, one of the, it's remarkable, one of the primary ways that we see many, many early folks that look like they might be doing missional work, the way they describe themselves, and oftentimes the way that authorities describe them is that they're described as pilgrims of the faith. And so the Irish tradition is particularly strong in this regard, so we're going to talk a little bit about Patrick and Columba and others. Uh, so I hope that you'll come back for that as, uh, as our first sort of installment in the history uh, from, from the history of mission. Any concluding comments or questions? Yeah, over here. Something that came to me that makes me really excited about next week now that I hear what you're saying is um, we have a history of sending pilgrim presence teams long ago. And because, you know, the choir sang Wana Baraka this morning, I've been thinking about my pilgrim presence trip many years ago to Africa. And the whole point of the Pilgrim Presence teams was not to convert people to Christianity. It was to go and be present and to join them in their cultures, to literally, to really join them and to get to know them in a lot. And I specifically, I shared this with the choir this, this week. I remember a part of the Maasai tribe coming and they created a song and they sang to us and they ministered to us. We didn't understand their language but I was touched so deeply and I could hear from my soul what they were saying to us. Mm. So I just hear you, whether you're aware of it or not, how you're tying in our history. And it just makes what you've shared today and what I'm hearing is going to come up next week makes me think of our history of Pilgrim Presence teams. Well, that, I, that feels pretty great because <laughs> I didn't know anything about, I really didn't know anything about, but, I, but this, I think there, there's this subterranean part of who this community already is and has been that we want to honor and I think connect to and that, that clearly can inform what it would mean for us to do, to kind of be missionally engaged as we move forward. So thank you for bringing that up. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Let me just say a quick word to pray us out. Lord, we thank you for, for this day. We thank you, we thank you for the sending that you yourself engaged in in, in coming and being in our midst in your son Jesus, but also for pouring out your spirit on us, allowing us then to participate in that act of self-giving.
Lord, we pray that you be with us now as we go forth and chew on this material, that what is useful go with us and what is not stay behind. In Jesus' name, amen. Absolutely.